everyone and welcome back to Cooking and Kids. In today's episode we are taking a road trip and we're taking you with us to see some of the most beautiful national parks. We're going to Navajo land and to help us pack for a trip we have Erin Burroughs who's going to show us a few tricks how she prepares for the long trips with her family. Upon return, I'm going to share with you how to make a traditional Navajo dish, which is fried bread. So with that said, let's hit the road. We are leaving our little town of Temecula and heading towards Zion National Park. Like any good explorers, we are going to follow the paths where ancient native people and pioneers walked. The park is located in the southern part of Utah near the city of Springdale and it's officially the first national park in Utah. Zion offers a backdrop of the most breathtaking mountain panoramas you will ever see. Created by wind, water and snow, this red rock wonderland is perfect for hiking. Its dramatic landscape evokes so many different emotions sense of amazement, appreciation, and inspiration, as well as the sense of responsibility. There was so much more to be seen and appreciated than what we had time for. So we're definitely coming back. But until then, we're back on the road and we are heading from Zion Park to Bryce National Park. Nature never ceases to amaze me. And that's the whole point of traveling and taking road trips so that you're able to see this and share it with your kids. And so here we are at the amphitheater of uh, Zion National Park. And needless to say, uh, we were all speechless. Over two and a half million of visitors comes to witness this nature's wonder every year. The park got its name by a Mormon settler called Ebenezer Bryce, who built his home near the Bryce Amphitheater. The distinctive red color and its texture comes from the iron-rich lime sediments that were deposited in the beds of series of lakes and streams. For 60 million years, water, wind, and snow have been playfully sculpting this beautiful red landscape. Not a single amusement park in the world can come even close to what nature has done here. This is definitely a must-see place for everybody, especially for young people and for our children. Such a beauty will impact them for the rest of their life and give them a greater appreciation for nature and their own country. There is so much to see in this short episode, so we are heading out towards Antelope Canyon. But before we get there, we are making a quick stop by the Lake Powell. Lake Powell is known as Arizona's playground for boating, water skiing, fishing, camping and hiking. To us, it was amazing to see this big body of water in the middle of the desert. After a quick stop, we were off to Antelope Canyon, which is only about three hours from the Bryce Canyon. For me personally, this was the most anticipated part of our trip. 
I've been admiring pictures of Antelope Canyon for most of my life through photographs and various documentaries. It was a bit overwhelming to finally uh, realize that I was here to see it with my own eyes and to touch it with my own hands. After entering the canyon, I felt like I was in an underground cathedral in which nature displayed its gifts and power. This is a sacred land to Navajo Nation, and this is a place where they gather to give their thanks and blessings to the force that has shaped and created this beauty. Unforgettable, and seeing it was such a gift to our family. I could have stayed in Antelope Canyon for months, but our roads were taking us to another monumental exploration. We were heading to Monument Valley. As a child, I could experience this only through encyclopedias and movies. I was so excited to share this experience with my children, who are both born and being raised here in the U.S. The story of this place is a powerful one, as is Navajo Nation, who continues to guard it and protect it for all its beauty and all that it is. I certainly hope that trips like these will spark love and appreciation both for nature and its country in my children's hearts. John Wayne liked this country and he made five of his westerns here. Stagecoach, Fort Apache, She Wore a Yellow Ribbon, Rio Grande and The Searchers. I am definitely coming back because I did not have a near enough time in this park. But until then, we are heading towards Arches National Park and are making quick stop at this famous photo place to snap a couple of pictures. You just gotta love this country. There's so much space and beauty out there. Arches National Park is just another testament how majestic this land truly is. We happened to arrive at the perfect time of the day because everything was wrapped in a golden sunlight. To get to the famous arches, you will need to take a long and steep hike, but it was all worth it because once we arrived there, the view was priceless. Just like in other parks, here too, we needed more time to immerse ourselves in nature and to explore around the park and see all the park had to offer. For now, we were losing a daylight and we needed to go and find the lodging for the night. As we were leaving the park, I saw this gigantic rock and I had such a urge to go and touch it. So I pulled over and I told my kids, I'll be just a minute. But before you know it, my kids followed and soon we were all nestled down at the bottom of this rock. This amazing desert land and its rocks called us to stay just a few minutes more, unveiling and sharing one of the most beautiful sunsets with us. Enjoying good food is such a big part of our road trips and to help us prepare and pack for our outings, we're gonna have Erin show us a couple of tricks that she usually does when she's getting her family ready to travel. Hi Vlada, thanks for having me on your show. My name is Erin and I'm a working mom of two boys who are six and four years old. My husband and I moved to the Bay Area of California about 10 years ago. We have really enjoyed taking road trips all around the beautiful state of California. So let's talk about how we prepare for road trips as a family. My husband usually packs the car, and while he's busy doing that, I'm in charge of the snacks. Um, I really think it's important to have healthy food options for your kids in long car rides because even though junk food might be fun, it just leaves empty calories and it might drive your kids to have sugar level spikes and be a little bit hyper in the car. So we try to think ahead and pack things that our kids will both enjoy and that are healthier options. So I'm gonna talk about what I prepare. 
I typically give each child a lunch bag. You have these fun little uh, penguin looking ice cubes and I stick that in there so that helps keep the food cold for about three to eight hour trips. We, we go with sandwiches for kind of a meal. This one's just cheese and turkey. I stay away from any condiments because that can make the bread soggy or mayonnaise might go bad. So keep it pretty plain. Peanut butter and jelly is always a winner. It doesn't have to be just for the kids. Adults like them too. Then we try to pick a vegetable and a fruit. So for my kids, what works is carrots or cut up peppers, sometimes cucumbers. Put them in little containers. And then I usually pack little travel size hummus or you know you can get avocado in a travel size pack either one goes pretty well with vegetables um, sometimes my kids just like to dip meat in either of those so I take these little pieces of turkey put them on a skewer put them in another container and some other snacks that go well with the hummus or the avocado are like pretzel sticks so I have these Nice little uh, travel bags that are also washable. And then anything else that needs to be cold, I can keep in the lunch bag and maybe pack a separate bag for other snacks that they can have throughout the trip. So over here, a couple other favorites in my family are for fruit options. Um, oranges are great if your kids can peel their own. Apples, if they can eat them without having them sliced. I find when you slice them, they turn brown, so that doesn't always work um, for long trips. Bananas, as long as you keep them safe so they don't get bruised. Um, but even dried fruits are great. Raisins or dried mangoes or dried strawberries, that works well too. Um, cheese sticks are an easy option if kids can peel themselves. Put that in the cold pack over here. Um, and my kids love these squeeze yogurt. It's also a nice option to get some extra protein in a travel pack. And over here I just have other healthy snacks that my kids like to eat. You know, sometimes it's like a fruit roll-up type of bar. Squeezable applesauce, again, just to keep it clean while you're in a car. And then these big bars. So options are endless. I mean, I just like to make sure I have enough snacks with me and enough substantial food that they can kind of consider a meal. And this stuff all works really well just for a car ride, but even if you're planning to go for a three-day weekend, if you're going camping, you can really do the same types of foods, just in bigger quantities and the bigger cooler. I'm gonna show you um, kind of a family favorite snack that we like to prepare ahead of time and it stays well. You can keep them in Ziploc bags or in a container and they're good for a couple weeks more if you put them in the freezer. But we like to make what's called energy balls. Uh, you can Google them and find many different recipes. What tends to work for our family and our taste buds is a pretty simple concoction of some rolled oats, some dried coconut flakes. I like the unsweetened kind because we're adding kind of a, a sugar base on top. Um, chocolate chips, you could use raisins, you could use nuts, you could use whatever you know suits your family's taste buds. Um, even coconut, if that doesn't go well with what your family likes, just add extra oats. Um, it's about a cup of co uh, oats, about a third of a cup of coconut, and about a half a cup of chocolate chips. And then about a fourth of a cup of chia seeds or flax seeds or something to kind of add a little extra protein. And then on top of that, I take about a cup of peanut butter and a half a cup of honey, mix them together and microwave it for a minute to get it um, the consistency right to mix together what turns into a batter like this. Again, this all takes literally the couple minutes I'm talking to you right now, so it's nice and easy. And then once you've mixed everything together, you take a tray that I like to line with parchment paper or foil. Just a tray by itself is fine. They don't really stick to anything. And then put the, the dough in your hand, kind of make, roll it or kind of just pat little balls together and put them on this tray. So I grew up in the Midwest, um, in Illinois, and all of our family vacations were essentially road trips. And I remember my mom would always have this blue tote bag and it was full of new coloring books and travel toys and just fun games to play while we were in the car. And it always made the road trip kind of exciting to look forward to because it was something new. So today I try to do the same thing for my kids. I usually pick up some new coloring supplies. Um, I like mess, um, water-free, you know, painting type of products. Um, we love travel games. 
so you can pick those up you know, at Amazon or Target. We also like to play games in the car, I Spy, or we use the same type of a game, but we call it the Alphabet Spy game, where we pick a letter of the alphabet, go through the entire alphabet, and find something on the road that starts with each letter. Pretty appropriate for you know, six and four year old type agents. Um, so once your tray is done, you just stick it in the freezer. These I did a little bit differently with some melted chocolate, but you get the same idea. Easy to eat. And delicious. Hopefully you learned something um, that you can do with your family uh, and take something away from this. And thank you, Vlada, for having me on your show. So to finish up our travel through Navajo land, I have a perfect recipe. This particular dish happens to be something that I too grew up on as a child. And this is a recipe for fried bread. So I'm going to show you how to start the dough and then we're going to take the dough outside and we're going to try to prepare this dish uh, outdoors just to make it more authentic. And uh, in my case, I'm feeding two boys. So I am using four cups because we're going to need a little bit more dough. Now, four cups of flour set aside. And then we're going to go with a cup of lukewarm water, a teaspoon of sugar, and about a teaspoon of yeast. Maybe a little teaspoon and a half. Mix it and just allow yeast to activate before you add it to flour. Depending on the temperature, yeast should normally activate within the first 10 to 15 minutes. So now the yeast is activated, we're gonna ask, make a dough. Um, for the dough, you would just need a little bit of salt, and I'm going with a half a teaspoon of salt. You can do a little bit more. See, this is one of my problems, you know, I can never just go exactly uh, one teaspoon, or uh, I always have to add a little bit more. And now we're just gonna bring this yeast in the middle, and then I'm gonna fetch a little bit more of warm water. Just to help with the measurements, I have a two cups of, additional two cups of lukewarm water. If you remember, we have a cup of, of warm water already here, and I have some more flour on the side. So basically, we will see how much water or moisture we will need to add to this uh, dough. So let's just start with about uh, additional two quarter Three quarter of a cup actually. We're just gonna start mixing. Let's add a little bit more. We wanna have a nice and soft dough uh, because soft dough will rise better and once when we fry it though it will be airy and more bubbly inside. So it's important that we don't end up with a thick and dense dough. I want to show you what dough should look like. As I mentioned, we wanted to have a thin dough, but uh, we also need to have it uh, where it's manageable. This is, at uh, this point, it's a little bit too sticky. So I'm just going to use this time to incorporate the flour and water really good. And for that, if you have a mixer, uh, that's great. KitchenAid is great. Otherwise, just use your fingers. As you move the dough, just kind of squeeze it and try to make a nice uh, texture. Go for the good texture, okay? When you're done with that, a little extra flour on the wall of a dish. Okay, scrape the dish because we don't want to waste any of this and then continue to work the dough. When you are add flour, add little at a time because all we're trying to do here is to kind of uh, shape the dough without adding too much flour and making it thick. So this is right now looking really good. The dough is nice and soft under my fingers. So I'm gonna work it a little bit more and then we will let it rest. So in old days, um, yeast was not accessible to everybody. So people made a dough with the local bacteria, 
like a sourdough bread. This is gonna make a great sourdough bread. And um, the beautiful thing about sourdough is that uh, it's, it's fragrance. I smells just heavenly. Our sourdough is going back to fridge because it's much quicker and easier to work with the yeast risen dough. All right, next step, I'm gonna let it rise. And today is a really warm day, which means the dough will activate probably in the next 15 to 20 minutes. And so that's just enough time for us to go in a, a vineyard and set up the cooking, uh, outdoor cooking area. Instead of dragging our barbecue down to vineyard, we decided to use the fire pit. So we pulled out the rack out of the oven, put uh, four cups on the side, and this will be our stove for tonight. With such a beautiful weather, I purposely wanted to cook these fry bread outside so the kids could enjoy the nature. This beautiful warm weather, it's doing a magic on our dough. Dough is almost ready for the next step. My son has a job to make sure that this little invention will work. So let's give it a shot. I hope this will work. Everyone is super hungry and they can't wait for the meal. And that's the way I like it. Because everybody's hungry and a bit impatient, we're just gonna start with the dough. So we're gonna need um, quite a bit of flour on the bottom because we don't want dough to stick. Then we're just gonna empty the dough. You see how nice and bubbly is inside, and that's what we need. Uh, normally, the more time you invest in rising the dough, the better the fry bread will be. But again, we're kind of speeding through this process bit. Now that um, dough is done, we're gonna thin it and let it rise again. All right, once you have the dough thin, just stretch the edges a little bit more and um, the dough will rise and once we cut it and before we fry it we're gonna stretch it a little bit more but basically this is about the thickness you're aiming for all around the dough so again keep in mind we are doing a double measurement here so my dough looks pretty big here but if you follow the four cup of flour recipe you should have half of this this dough and um, it would be easier to work with. So we got it to the perfect thinness and now we're just gonna let the dough rest and rise once again. Right, so you're gonna need a, a handsome portion, a portion of oil. So maybe about inch and a half of in depth. And then we're gonna uh, warm this up. All right, now we're gonna cut them. And using a pizza cutter is a, is a very good idea. Now we're just gonna have to wait probably another 15 to 20 minutes for the dough to rise once again. Even this waiting time has its charm because this was the perfect time for kids to calm down, to really absorb the nature around them and to relax. And most of all, this was a good time for them to reconnect and engage in a conversation with their cousin who was visiting with us. If you are visiting my channel for the first time, you might not be aware that I'm also a founder and a CEO of a charitable organization called Vlad Seeds of Life, whose mission is to reconnect American families and communities. Okay, it looks like we are ready to put this little cooking adventure to a true test. We got the fire going and now the key is to maintain the flame under the frying pan because we are experiencing little evening breeze and it looks like we are losing some of the heat but we will just have to figure out how to do this and we'll somehow manage all right so let's give it a shot i have never cooked uh, fried bread on an open flame like this um, obviously this is uh, going to be a little challenge because the flames are not remaining under the pot the whole time, which might not give us the perfect temperature, but it looks like 
it's working for now. Okay, it should be nice and brown on the other side. It is golden actually, perfect. This is actually working out. I was concerned that we will not have enough uh, flame, but we're managing and the, this is the first one and it's looking absolutely perfect. I'm gonna stretch it. Ooh, this is really stretchy. Okay, and then fry it. With the right kind of fire, you only need about a minute to minute and a half on each side. So this is the first one and they are amazing. I mean, without anything. We got some Nutella, we got jam, uh, honey, cinnamon and all the good stuff. And this is gonna be tonight's dinner. So Matia, so, so, so good. Generations and generations of children were raised on a similar uh, foods like a fried bread. So Navajo or Serbia and the there recipe is almost exactly the same. And this is the kind of food that most children in the world will say yes to. Fried bread is delicious Working both served like savory and sweet. We usually serve it with the raw honey right? with a lot of walnuts, like, homemade jams. Like, but as tonight you'll see it, we are serving it with Nutella. Also, they're phenomenal served with the cold cuts and various cheeses. However you do it, this is truly a, a great beginning to many different dishes and variations. So go ahead and make it, enjoy it, and I trust you will like it. And by the way, it was so good, even bunnies could not resist the smell. A delicious treat like this is also great served so, with the quality like family time. Or simply good. relaxing right. among your friends and your family, and maybe your neighbors. And just the taking a moment to make memories and to enjoy beautiful summer afternoons. This is definitely the most delicious way to end your travels um, and that is to embrace it uh, with the food and culture of the places that you visited. Um, as I said in the beginning of this video, uh, this happens to be something that my mom used to make and I was very surprised to find out that this was a staple food for Navajo Nation for uh, many, many decades. So, Delicious by all means and I would definitely encourage you to try to do this with your family and your kids But more than that, I would encourage you to take a trip with your children and go and explore this wonderful country of ours Taking road trips is fun and it's memorable in so many ways. Thank you all for watching I look forward to spending more time with you in our next episode and until then, please take good care of yourself and those around you. Thank you so much for watching and for spending time with us. I hope you like this video and I hope you'll send us your likes and you will subscribe. Just this year, we drove from San Diego to New York and along the way, we picked up a quite a few more recipes which we can't wait to share with you. So stay tuned. Thank you.